it's my great pleasure to be talking about this because some of the methods that I'll be presenting actually started as a as a project uh, as, as a course project for deep learning course in Alto. So I'm quite happy to be presenting them. Okay, uh, so now I just need to figure out how to. And just, okay, yeah, and there we go. So I'm going to be talking because uh, basically decoding electromagnetic brain activity is not uh, maybe the most popular application of machine learning and, and deep learning techniques. Everybody talks more, ma mainly about natural things like uh, natural language processing and maybe more related to convolutional neural networks image processing. Uh, so uh, I feel like uh, I need to introduce the, the field first and uh, talk about some opportunities uh, and motivation for using machine learning methods in general uh, in functional brain imaging. Uh, so then I'm going to introduce a few methods that I developed in my doctoral thesis uh, for decoding electromagnetic brain activity. And, uh, so as already told here, uh, those are based on convolutional neural networks and uh, talk a little bit uh, about the specificity of our domain because basically we are doing uh, brain science. We're interested in figuring out how the brain actually works. So uh, uh, one of the focus areas in my work is uh, how do we actually use these methods to learn something new about, uh, about the brain. And for that, we need to be able to interpret what kind of patterns uh, our networks learn from the data. Okay, so let's start with the brain imaging as an application domain for machine learning methods. Uh, and uh, modern uh, brain imaging technologies uh, are quite advanced and they come basically in two different flavors. One are based on the metabolic activity. So basically they measure the, the blood flow to, in the brain tissue. And that can be used as an indirect measure of uh, uh, of the neural activity because when uh, when neurons uh, are activated, the blood flow increases. And this is uh, how basically we can infer that, for example, this part of the brain is active at the moment. Uh, the cool thing about metabolic based uh, methods is that they have excellent uh, spatial resolution, so you can uh, look very precisely into what areas. Uh, of the brain are active at the moment. For example, with functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, it produces this nice kind of imaging and you can, uh, you can also look deeper in, into the brain and uh, well, do many interesting things. And uh, well, for those of you who haven't seen that before, the fMRI machine looks like this. In this talk, however, I will talk more about the electrophysiology based methods uh, that investigate the uh, electric activity of neurons uh, uh, and more specifically on those which don't require surgery. For example, this electric orticogram uh, uh, is an invasive method, so it requires implantation of electrodes uh, directly on the cortex. Uh, but since, uh, and, uh, and this data is only typically available from the patients who uh, get these implants. Uh, as a preparation step for neurosurgery, for example. What we're going to be talking about is this electroencephalogram, EEG, which looks like this, uh, and magnetoencephalogram, a bit fancier <laughs> looking device. Uh, those two uh, basically uh, measure the coordinated activity of the cortical neurons. So let me briefly introduce how it works. Everybody knows I guess uh, that neurons uh, in the brain are electrically active cells. Uh, and uh, one of the properties of the cortical pyramidal cells is that they have the dendrites, uh, which are aligned in a way that they are perpendicular to the, to the cortical surface. So this is a very useful property because whenever a large number of these cells uh, receive inputs uh, called postsynaptic uh, potentials, uh, and we are talking about some tens of thousands of the cells getting activated simultaneously, just, that, just so that you understand the scale of the problem. Uh, uh, this, the current, uh, it produces these postsynaptic currents, uh, which are strong enough to be detected outside of the brain. And basically, uh, this uh, coordinated activation of the large number of the cells uh, 
produces an electric field, which can be measured by placing the electrodes on the skull, for example, here and here, uh, which would result in electroencephalogram. And also this same activity has a magnetic component, uh, which can be measured by a pickup coils uh, resulting in the MEG or magnetoencephalographic signals. And one advantage of MEG uh, is that the magnetic field doesn't get distorted when it passes through all the tissues, uh, which results in a uh, significantly higher spatial resolution. So you can tell two uh, simultaneously active neural sources apart, even if they're pretty close to each other. So that's about that's about all about neuroscience. <laughs> so the, the, the raw data, for example, looks like this. And of course, by just looking at it, you cannot really tell much. Uh, well, if you are trained uh, neuroscientist, well, you can notice, for example, that here's uh, some nice rhythmic activity and each row represents one channel or one sensor. And for example, if we're talking about MEG, uh, the sensor array looks like this and it has about 306 channels uh, and each row in this uh, data re represents measurements uh, which are originate from uh, a single channel and this is about 10 seconds in the data so you see there is quite a lot of going uh, of things going on and, and quite a lot of things that you can measure for example like i said this nice rhythmic activity over here uh, this slightly higher amplitude is what we are mostly interested in in the experiments this is probably a response to some kind of stimuli for example a visual or an auditory or something like this. And this uh, is, uh, for example, the artifact uh, which uh, occurs in the data when the subject blinks uh, or there are some eye movements or something of that sort. And for example, you can see immediately that some sensors are noisier than the others. Uh, those occur, those things occur because uh, this is a highly sensitive equipment and it's really hard to, uh, for example, uh, well, there are always external so sources of magnetic interference and uh, and things like that so many things uh, many things are happening uh, in the data at once uh, so if we go more closer to to the machine learning uh, to summarize what we can actually extract from the data so we have a measurement from a large array of sensors uh, which are uh, in this helmet shaped form uh, each sensor measures, uh, of course, the activity of large number of these so-called neural sources, the, the ones that we are interested in. And ultimately, we are interested, of course, in what kind of brain areas produce these signals. Uh, but the problem here is that uh, each sensor picks up a large number of these neural sources. And similarly, a single neural source uh, uh, projects uh, its activity or uh, many sensors detect uh, the activity from uh, or almost all the sensors detect the activity from uh, from a single neural source. So what we're dealing here is a mixture uh, of simultaneous activity of large number of neural sources and it's always uh, useful to think about uh, the measurements as a sum of this neural sources which are we which we don't observe directly but uh, it is always useful to think that uh, each source projects into the sensor space or the measurement space uh, with some spatial structure, which we will refer to as uh, sensor topography. So I might explain this plot in a little bit more detail. So this is a representation of the subject's head. This little triangle here is the nose. So the head, if you look at, at the head from the top, the, those are the ears. Uh, so basically the subject is facing uh, upwards because we will see quite quite a few of these plots later on. Uh, and uh, this is the topography of the magnetic field which uh, originates from the activation of this neural source. Uh, one, so, there's, there's one yes. question. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is why does mere blinking distort brain activity that much when you mentioned artifacts? So, okay. That, this is an excellent question. Let me go one slide back. Uh, so, of course, this is not the brain activities. This is electromagnetic, or this is, these are magnetic signals. And blinking 
of course, involves uh, activation of the muscles which move basically the eyelids, right? And the signal from the muscles is a lot, a lot stronger than whatever we are measuring from the brain. So this is an, also an electric source. This is source of no interest, so to say, but it contaminates the signal. So there are methods to separate neural sources from all kinds of artifacts. And this is actually very uh, on the spot question because uh, the main challenge, uh, as I will explain a little bit later in dealing with this data is not to is not that the, the features that we are extracting are so complex as for example, in image processing. But the problem is that, that there is a lot of uh, irrelevant activity going on at the same time. So there is a bad background brain activity and there is all kinds of these physiological artifacts, which also have an electromagnetic component, but essentially it is not interesting for us as brain scientists because we are not studying uh, the activity of eye muscles, uh, but we're more interested in, in what's going on in the brain. So thanks, thanks for the question. And uh, I encourage everybody to ask uh, if something feels unclear or you're just curious about stuff. I hope I answered that. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, where were we? Uh, so we have uh, uh, this spatial topography, right? So each neural source, I hope I convinced you that each neural source projects on some number of sensors and the single sensor picks up a mixture of the activity of different neural sources. And also, uh, of course, uh, since I already mentioned that uh, these techniques have quite high spatial resolution, we also can perform the, the waveform analysis. So for example, here, uh, uh, this particular neural source was, wasn't very active, but then for example, we presented some stimuli and we observe this type of waveform and we are interested generally uh, from the machine learning point of view in detecting this, uh, this waveform and, uh, and studying it, and for example, seeing under which conditions uh, it arises. And for example, if the amplitude changes uh, with certain experimental manipulations and things like that. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I have shown you that uh, the data that we're dealing with have some uh, complex, quite complex spatial temporal structure, meaning that uh, there, is a, there is a mixture of things going on in, in, in the sensor space, and there is a certain uh, time courses which we are interested in modeling and, and detecting. Uh, the main challenge, as I already mentioned also, is, is that uh, uh, the amount of information that we are interested in, uh, well, for example, if we're talking about responses, uh, brain responses to a cer certain stimuli, uh, there is quite a lot of things going on in the brain, like eye movement artifacts. There are also cardiac artifacts from the from the activity of the heart, because that's also quite a strong electromagnetic source. There is all kinds of environmental uh, interferences, uh, which I won't maybe describe too much. But for example, when there was this uh, railway construction in Otaniemi, there are quite a lot of heavy electric machinery happening and that of course affects our signals uh, quite strongly too. So generally uh, one of the main computational challenges is quite low signal to noise ratio and uh, the problem is to separate the sources of interest uh, from sources of no non-interest and I'm talking electromagnetic sources here. Uh, 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 yeah and basically makes sense but the good news is that uh, also mentioned already that compared, for example, for image processing, if we're talking the uh, representational capacity needed for, the, for, for detecting these sources, uh, the complexity, uh, like the computational complexity of, of these uh, things is fairly low. Uh, well, again, in comparison to, for example, speech or image processing. Uh, one specific problem, uh, which I maybe won't describe too much now in the detail, but I will also uh, to talk about it a bit later is that uh, every brain is a little bit different. So anatomical differences in folding of the cortex are quite strong, which results in quite high uh, variability of the brain signals uh, just due to differences in the individual cortical geometry. So uh, the, the, the whatever detection methods or, or decoding methods that we're gonna use uh, need to be robust 
uh, to those kind of uh, uh, variability and that doesn't uh, well th this is not a very straightforward problem but this is actually one of the uh, one of the problems that uh, convolutional neural networks uh, seem to be addressing a little bit better than uh, well other state-of-the-art brain decoding methods okay so and after after some processing, uh, what we're usually interested in is uh, this set of uh, topographies in the sensor space, for example, if we, uh, and then uh, we can use uh, biophysical and anatomical modeling to estimate which neural sources uh, produce this type of observed signals. But this is more of a classical analysis of the image data. So for example, uh, if we present visual stimuli to the left and right hemifield, we will uh, observe this kind of topographies. And then we, when we do the source estimation procedures that we see that uh, if we present the visual stimuli in the left hemifield, the contralateral or the, uh, the visual cortex, which is in the back of the head, uh, back of the brain uh, uh, gets activated, which is of course, we know that from the previous literature and same happens if we present the visual stimuli to the right visual hemifield, uh, then we will see that the left visual cortex get, gets more activated. Uh, if we uh, stimulate uh, the nerves in the left and the right arm, similarly, we see that there are some of the sensory cortex on the opposite side of the, uh, of the head and auditory signals also produce the, the, uh, the activations in the, in the, uh, in the auditory cortex, uh, which is more in the temporal lobe, uh, so on, on, on the side of the brain. Okay, so that's about it. Uh, so the classical analysis usually goes that we present different stimuli uh, and we measure uh, brain responses to the signal. And, and the goal of this analysis is to explain how the observed signal changes as a result of our experimental manipulation. So this is, uh, this is how we classically analyze the data uh, without any machine learning. So the alternative approach uh, is to kind of uh, try to predict what is happening in the data, for example, uh, if I intend to move my arm like this uh, directly from the measurements. And this is where machine learning methods come in. And this is called uh, a decoding approach as opposed to encoding approach. So we try to represent uh, the experimental manipulation as a function of the data and maybe predict it directly from the data by extracting patterns from the observed signals. Uh, and this should already sound familiar to machine learning people. And two applications of this decoding approach is, uh, for example, identifying biomarkers of different uh, biological disorders. Sorry for the typo here. This requires, of course, collection of large and standardized data sets, typically thousands of individuals. And these initiatives already are starting in the field. So there is quite a lot of potential uh, for application of like real deep learning models. Uh, those typically focus on uh, measuring the brain data at rest. So meaning that there is no specific task. Uh, and of course, for these methods, interpreting uh, like what's actually going on in the brain and based on what the model is able to uh, uh, make their predictions is extremely important because this is a high stake. Uh, they, they can be a high stakes medical decisions based on this well in some future. Uh, the one application, another application, which is close to what I do, uh, is uh, basically development of brain machine interfaces and brain computer interfaces are uh, basically techniques which allow you to control, for example, external devices uh, almost in real time uh, by modulating your brain activity. For example, you can imagine the movement which will produce without moving your hand explicitly, uh, and then. Uh, it will produce uh, brain signals uh, uh, in, in the brain areas uh, responsible for motor planning. And then the sensors can detect the signals and uh, uh, basically the system can decode your intention and for example, uh, move an exoskeleton arm or, or, or things like that. This application typically requires smaller data sets, which is great news for us because uh, basically you can imagine that data collection is a lot more expensive than, for example, gathering an image set uh, or something of that sort. That involves performing uh, specific tasks, for example. Well, I will I will talk about examples a little bit later. Uh, and the, the main focus is, of course, to get accurate predictions uh, and interpretation is, well, desirable, but less important, maybe. So if we talk about application of uh, non-invasive brain computer interfaces, there are a few. 
well, research obviously being one. Uh, for example, motor rehabilitation uh, after stroke, uh, people uh, typically uh, suffer from severe motor impairments. And for example, if we can uh, design a system that based on these brain signals uh, kind of identifies the intention to move the arm, for example, we can produce some sort of stimulation to, uh, to the affected arm. Uh, and uh, this way uh, induce, uh, well, the thing called neuroplasticity, uh, basically uh, trying to uh, restore this function. And there are, of course, other applications such as entertainment, uh, communication, for example, for locked in patients, uh, when you lose uh, all control of your uh, so, so, so the locked out in patients are, are, are people who are basically in a state of coma, but their consciousness is preserved. Uh, so, for example, uh, we can design a system that based on their brain activity and focus of their, they can focus on, for example, one of the audio streams. And based on that, they can uh, answer like a set of simple yes or no questions. We can use the systems to uh, monitor physiological states and, uh, well, uh, the external device control is uh, a bit maybe out of reach of the modern non-invasive technology because as you can see on the y-axis is a number of states that we can uh, robustly uh, detect or decode from the brain activity using these measures uh, from electro and magnetoencephalography uh, and the acceptable accuracy of course for this uh, if you for example in research it just has to be like what we call above the chance level. It doesn't have to be perfect. Then for external device control, again, the stakes are quite high uh, and the requirements of the accuracy is, well, basically the, the, the decoding accuracy is, uh, well, as high as possible pretty much. Uh, so, uh, but this is about the state of the art. And of course, MEG is a slightly more accurate uh, measurement technique. And uh, because of its higher spatial resolution, we can, uh, decode simultaneously a la larger number of brain states. Uh, so there are two driving forces of progress here. So for example, better sensor technology moves us towards more uh, brain states, which we can simultaneously decode. And the algorithm development moves us towards, of course, more uh, higher accuracy. Uh, so yeah, that, that's about it. And well, when, uh, maybe one example. May I? Uh, Quickly what? interrupt. Uh, there are a few questions, if I may. Yes, sure. Forward to you. Yeah, the first question is about the, the computational complexity. So uh, this uh, low complexity, isn't this somewhat depending on the amount of sensors you're using? You, you, if it would be possible, you could place millions of small antennas uh, around the brain. So you would have extremely high dimensional signals and processing such high dimensional signals, wouldn't this involve a uh, high computational complexity? Okay, yeah, uh, great question again. Uh, so uh, yeah, of course you can uh, increase the number of sensors and this is uh, actually one way of uh, uh, basically moving this whole technology forward. Uh, the problem is here is not that there is not maybe enough sensors because uh, it, with, with the, uh, like I said, the problem is, uh, well, basically first the noise and then uh, maybe even more precisely the signal to noise ratio. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned in the, in the second slide, we have, uh, we need to have quite a large number of neurons uh, which are simultaneously active uh, to, to produce the signal which uh, basically, which we can measure uh, outside of the head. And this, uh, well, if we talk about magnetic fields, for example, these magnetic fields are uh, about six orders of magnitude uh, weaker. The brain magnetic fields are six orders uh, of magnitude weaker than the background magnetic field of the Earth. So these measurements are, for example, performed uh, in the magnetically shielded room uh, that uh, isolate the subject and its brain <laughs> from the background magnetic field of the earth. This is quite, uh, quite. I don't have a picture of that, but that's quite an impressive uh, structure in itself. There. 
the magnetically shielded room. Uh, and then uh, there is a problem that you're still quite far, and these sensors, are, uh, they are called uh, squids, so superconductive quantum interference devices. To operate, they need to be immersed in liquid helium because they are basically based on sub superconductivity and they uh, need to operate at quite low temperature. And then, of course, uh, there is a thermal, thermal insulation layer. So those sensors are quite far away from the head, which of course uh, also decreases the signal to noise ratio. So for example, one uh, area of improvement of the sensing technology uh, is that uh, they uh, developed the sensors also in Alto, and I'm working with those kind of sensors, uh, which do not require uh, well, sub superconductivity, they operate pretty much in room temperature, and that means that you can place those sensors closer to the head, and the magnetic field uh, deteriorates as a cube of the distance between the neural source uh, and the head. So just by moving the sensors closer to the head, you can, of course, increase uh, the signal to noise ratio and the spatial resolutions. And, uh, there is, and it's actually a lot makes a lot more sense to put more of those sensors uh, but uh, the problem still remains uh, is that first uh, there is a there is a mixture of things going on and then just basically uh, by simply increasing the number of sensors you cannot change the physics okay there is only the amount of information you can measure yeah. and this is what like well pretty fundamental problem and yeah. uh, well many people are addressing that okay. so it's it's not possible at the moment or do you know if if, if such se something similar will be soon possible to print on a fabric like on a hat which you can wear when you run so you have printed such sensing devices in in your clothes uh so if we're talking uh about magnetoencephalography it's not exactly portable at the moment yeah. because you need to, well, it's portable, <laughs> but inside the magnetically shielded room. So you can't okay. wear it. <laughs> yeah. It can it's be made so portable, let me put it this way. Some, yeah. uh, so for example, these optically pumped magnetometers, which I, uh, which operate at the room temperature and don't require superconductivity, uh, you can basically move the, with them. But the problem is that of course you are moving in, in some background magnetic field, which distorts the signal quite, quite strongly, let me put it this yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, uh, if we're talking about electroencephalography, there are wearables, but like I said, the electric signal gets distorted quite heavily when passing through the, uh, yeah, well, the skull mainly, uh, the skin and, and the cerebrospinal fluid. So you don't, uh, so the spatial resolution and the amount of sig uh, amount of neural sources which you can discriminate is actually quite low. Uh, so uh, with these non-invasive measures, uh, we are really looking into some very basic waveforms which have, uh, well, some sort of uh, spatial fingerprint in the sensor space. Okay. Uh, more, so of course you can extract more information from invasive measurements because there are, for example, single unit uh, uh, measurements, uh, single neuron measurements, and there's a lot more information than mm. those, but then you require surgery for this. Mm. For example, well, no. I need to maybe mention Elon Musk here, but stop at this. Let's let's discuss if, if there are any questions regarding those, I can also answer that, but maybe yeah. after the talk. Yeah, maybe one quick question, uh, and then I, I, I let you continue, and we have collected questions in the end. Uh, so this other question was, is the, the mapping of signals to specific brain locations a purely mathematical problem? So I, I think the, the question is, is uh, targeting if we have enough computational resources, so the biggest supercomputer, is it possible to associate a specific signal pattern with a specific region in the brain, or is this somewhat uh, ambiguous? Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, there are, so mathematically speaking, uh, uh, there are uh, a lot more possible neural sources than we have sensors, right? Uh, so, in a sense, that, that is an ill-posed problem because we are dealing with more unknowns than knowns. Uh, however, uh, you can introduce uh, various types of constraints into this computation. For example, one obvious is that I showed already is anatomical constraints. Uh, 
So how we get these pictures, we take the subject's uh, MRI, uh, the brain MRI, and then we can basically make a 3D reconstruction of the surface of the subject's brain. And then since we already know that the neurons that produce these signals are always orthogonal to the surface of the cortex, uh, then we can basically, based on the reconstruction of the cortex, we can uh, constrain the number of uh, these neural sources or, or the, the orientations of these neural sources to be orthogonal to the, uh, to the surface of the brain. So that's one way of uh, constraining those. Uh, then there are different methods. Actually, it's, it's quite interesting and very separate uh, field of mathematics solving this electromagnetic inverse problems. So modeling, um, uh, oh yeah, and of course, uh, if we're dealing, for example, with electroencephalography and even magnetoencephalography, uh, then different, you can uh, model the uh, electric conductivity and magnetic permittivity of different uh, tissues, and then make your biophysical model of the signal uh, uh, like a lot more precise. So there are basically two sides of this uh, source modeling problems. One is called the forward problem, where you basically try to come up with as accurate biophysical model uh, of uh, the generation of this signal. So that means uh, anatomy uh, or, or, and, and the conductivity. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, and then there is an inverse problem, uh, which is always in ill post, and that's heavily based on some kind of constraints and, and assumptions to, 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 uh, to estimate the neural sources. So the, the inverse problem goes like how, uh, like to find the configuration of neural sources that produce, like which we of course don't observe directly, which produce this type of observations. Uh, yeah, and if you're interested in that, uh, yeah, I can give you some references on just basically reviewing the subject, but this is quite an active area of research and there is some progress, but quite a lot of progress in this area, of course. And there are different methods and uh, yeah, based on like what kind of task are you trying to solve, there are ones are maybe better than the others. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, so yeah, so, well, maybe we can skip this example, uh, yeah, but basically one of the examples from the recent papers is that uh, uh, this is not purely brain machine interface, but it is I brain machine interface. So basically we, we also uh, monitored uh, the subject control these lines like game. We just need to put the circles of the same color in the line uh, to earn some points with their gaze. But then since the eye movement activity uh, is, well, largely spontaneous, so you move your eyes pretty much all the time, uh, we use brain data to discriminate whether the subject fixated on, on, on this cross voluntarily or it wasn't just spontaneous fixation. And we were able dis to discriminate the spontaneous versus voluntary fixations based on the brain data. Yeah, so uh, this is just one fun application of this technology. Well, the rest of the experiments are, you can imagine, are less of a game and more of the boring data collection procedures. All right, so just to summarize this part, if we compare uh, neural signal this decoding with, for example, traditional application domain of machine learning, such as image processing, uh, there are a few differences. So for example, uh, in image processing, the well, let's let's talk about toy problems like classifying cats versus dogs or something. The labels are quite well defined. So if you look at the image, you see that this is a dog right away. In brain imaging, it's not always that straightforward uh, because whatever differences in brain activity you expect to observe, uh, that is always based on some sort of hypothesis. Uh, and uh, so it's 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 more. Uh, yeah, well, basically, it's, it, it's more a hypothesis than a given fact, and you can, uh, and so the labels are, in a sense, more fuzzy, and there is a lot, another layer of complexity that, for example, even if you have a good scientific hypothesis, you can uh, design an experiment which doesn't produce the uh, desired uh, brain outcome, or, uh, brain signals that you expect to see, so there is quite a lot more unknowns in, in, in the labels, even, on, on, on the level of the labels. 
uh, the challenges in image processing is, of course, to represent very complex features uh, and, uh, well, make uh, your system robust to all kinds of uh, sources of variation, for example, translation invariance, rotation invariance, and, uh, well, other sort of scale invariance, uh, that sort of thing. The main challenge in, with, in our domain is mostly like low signal to noise ratio, so you need to separate the sources of the signal uh, to the noise. There is this high inter-individual uh, variability in the signals, so that's why we use biophysical modeling, for example, for uh, all kinds of confounding factors, for example, uh, well, eye, eye movement artifacts, uh, and of course the interpretation, uh, because basically we, we try to learn something new about the brain. Uh, there is, I will, yeah, so there is a, applications for transfer learning also, so uh, I will maybe not go into detail, or maybe I, if we have time, I have a, like a bonus <laughs> to talk a little bit about transfer learning because that, that that's quite an interesting uh, topic. But basically, uh, in image processing, uh, people use typically transfer learning for extracting low-level visual features, uh, and we use it mo mostly to uh, kind of learn something new about the brain. Uh, the data is more abundant and occurs naturally. Well, naturally meaning on the internet. <laughs> uh, in, uh, in neuroscience data, of course, is usually collected uh, is an experiment and more expensive, and that's why it's more scarce. And finally, if we want to interpret what actually the, uh, the networks do, uh, mainly in, in classical machine learning or deep learning, uh, that question boils down to what features that does the model do to, produ to produce these uh, predictions. In our case, it's mostly uh, like we're trying to learn uh, something about how the brain works, so how the actual just to, to study the external phenomena, and that, that makes, of course, the uh, the whole interpretation story uh, a lot more important. Okay, let's talk about some convolutional neural networks finally. So that was all uh, about the domain. If you have any questions, maybe it makes sense to address those now. Otherwise, we're already have yeah, something like twenty minutes left. <laughs> Uh, all right, so you already know by this time that uh, convolutional neural networks have a few interesting prop properties that makes them particularly useful uh, in our domain. Uh, three of them I will focus on uh, called parameter sharing, uh, sparsity and then various to local translations. I don't know guys how, how much do you know, but you probably heard those terms before. Uh, so. Uh, but in a nutshell, convolution can be uh, viewed as a pattern detecting operation uh, by template matching. And the template uh, is encoded in the weights of the so-called convolution kernels. For example, this kernel uh, seems to be optimized for detecting this type of diagonal lines. Uh, and then in convolutional neural networks, uh, the, the, the coefficients of this kernel are trained by backpropagation to basically to op optimize the, uh, the decoding uh, outcome, whether it's a classification or a regression task. Uh, by parameter sharing, I mean that the same set of parameters in this kernel uh, gets uh, applied to the, to the, uh, to the dimensions, uh, to, to the whole along the dimensions of the input data. So uh, essentially, uh, these parameters, whatever parameters this kernel end up uh, having are shared in all representation, and then it produces the, 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 uh, the output, which is called the feature map, which is usually quite sparse. And by sparse, I mean that, for example, uh, if you look at this spot of the input, uh, it has quite a high output in the uh, uh, quite uh, high uh, affinity to the to the kernel let's put it this way uh, and the rest of the of the feature map has quite the low uh, values of, of the output uh, so uh, in this sense uh, yeah so basically feature det uh, pattern detection by by template matching uh, and then since the kernel it's translated along the along the dimensions it also, uh, well, you probably already said uh, there, that the, it produces the equivariance equi to translation, which means that if you translate the output, you will see the similar translation, uh, translate the input, you will uh, observe the similar translation of the output. And then combining the convolution uh, with the pooling, uh, 
uh, operation uh, results in uh, the uh, invariance to the local translations, uh, which is very useful property for us uh, as neuroscientists, because if we're talking about, for example, evoked responses, they can uh, occur at different latencies. And so, so brain responses to a certain stimuli, they can occur in slightly different latencies in, in the time domain. So basically, but the, of course the differences are on the scale of milliseconds in our case, uh, but still we would like our classifier, for example, to be robust to those kind of changes. So uh, knowing what we know about uh, the data generating process, uh, we designed, uh, uh, well, initially a classifier uh, based on uh, the, what, what we know about how these signals are generated. And if you remember what I was talking about, uh, the, the sub superposition, uh, so we have, so we know exactly two things uh, based on what I told you before. Uh, so we know that, that if we're talking about uh, the image data as input, for example, we have the time dimension here on the X axis and the, the sensors, uh, uh, well, different sensors on the Y axis. Uh, so we came up with a very simple uh, architecture of the convolutional neural network, uh, which basically trains a special spatial filter. So the orange thingy here uh, is basically the size of the filter. And uh, because we cannot use, uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same assumptions as for example, are valid for, for image processing, we have to have a spatial filter that spans all the sensors at the same time, because like I said, each neural source can, uh, well, in principle, um, project onto all of the sensors. So we, first train a number of spatial filters in the sensor space to try to come up with the time course of a single neural source. And those are of course treated as latent sources because we cannot uh, uh, observe them directly. So once we apply the spatial filter, so that would be a first operation in, 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 in the convolutional neural network. And we train a bunch of these filters to kind of come up with some number of these latent sources. So the, the latent sources here are represented by this K. So there are fewer, uh, so we try to use the correlations in the center, sensor space, in other words, uh, to come up with the time course uh, of a latent source. And uh, from physics, we know that the, prop, that the mixing properties in the sensor space are essentially linear. So we don't have to have any non-linearity in this layer. So the next layer, uh, is uh, more similar to a classical uh, filtering operation. You can think about the band pass or, or low pass or high pass filter in the, in, in the time domain. Uh, so it's a one dimensional convolution, but across time domain. And since we already applied uh, the spatial filter to estimate one uh, latent time, time course, so we need to just basically train uh, a one dimensional convolution, uh, convolution kernel uh, to be able to approximate the time course uh, of this latent component. Uh, and then there is a pooling operation, uh, which is standard one, and then there is a single output layer also. And, and the, the only non-linearity happens after, after the pooling quite uh, well standard for convolutional neural networks. And this is how we obtain the uh, invariance to shifts uh, in, across time axis pretty much. So uh, what we were able to show is that this rather simple architecture, but informed by what we know about uh, how the signals are generated, seem to be outperforming, uh, for example, uh, such a standard thing used in the field as uh, support vector machines. So the, 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 gray, uh, the gray bar is our guy, uh, and this is a support vector machine. So this is validation performance. Uh, because we mostly were trying to build a system which is robust to inter-individual differences, we used this so-called leave one subject out cross-validation approach. So we basically have seven subjects here, about uh, 1,000 of or 980 repetitions of each uh, stimuli. Uh, 
and there were five different types of stimuli. So we were trying to predict, uh, well, the, I, I showed it already, if it's a visual stimuli shown to the left or to the right, if it's a stimulation of the late left or the right arm, or if it's an auditory stimuli, like a tone presented to the, well, basically subject heard a tone. And then we measured the brain activity and tried to predict what type of stimuli was, uh, was shown to the subject. So, in this procedure, we trained on six subjects and they used the, the seven subject uh, well in the cross validation. So that worked also fairly well, although, yeah. And then uh, because uh, neural networks uh, basically also have this nice property that they can be updated as soon as uh, the new data arise, that is actually very useful in uh, real brain machine interfaces. Uh, because basically you can update uh, uh, the classifier on the fly. So what we did here is that we trained on other people uh, and then we uh, simulated uh, where the subject before, for example, is exposed to the same new subject um, is exposed to the same type of stimuli, but we update the, the classifier each time that the, the, the data and the labels become available. And this is, of course, uh, we can do that because we can do, we, we are doing this in the, in the in the well controlled experimental environment. Uh, so this is, for example, the model a more complex deeper neural network that was developed previously uh, to classify uh, electro EEG signals called EEG net. Quite a nice model, and this is like general purpose but very deep neural network. But it is uh, well VDG nineteen. You probably know because it was developed for image processing initially. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's talk a little bit, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then uh, basically because the structure of the network is so simple, we have a spatial filter uh, from which we can derive the, uh, the spatial fingerprint of the neural source that we are interested in. And then there is a temporal filter which basically tells us at which frequency this neural population uh, produces their signals. So. And this is what we're like as neuroscientists, we're mostly interested in uh, what kind of uh, neural sources uh, produce this activity. And for example, if uh, so, this is based on the, uh, on the patterns that the model learned from the data, actually. Uh, so uh, we can see that actually the visual stimuli produce the signals in the visual cortex and some of the sensory, uh, in some of the sensory cortex and auditory uh, signals. Uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how we can do it uh, and how maybe not to do it also. So the biggest problem with uh, machine learning and neuroimaging is this uh, very naive approach, uh, which basically uh, people uh, use this black, black box model, sometimes very, very complex model. Uh, uh, and the only conclusions uh, to, to come up with some sort of predictions, maybe even quite accurate, uh, but the only conclusions that we can draw from this data as scientists is to say that, okay, we, we've been able to decode whatever from the brain activity. Uh, what we're actually interested in is that we have some hypothesis about the, the brain work, how the brain works. We formulate the problem. Uh, we kind of design the experiment uh, and uh, plan the, how to measure what we are interested in. Then we apply all kinds of pre-processing. We extract features and design the model to decode it. And then the, the nice thing about deep learning that you can combine pretty much feature extraction and model design uh, into the same framework. We come up with some sort of results, whether it's prediction accuracy or some other more like fancy metric. But without the interpretation, we cannot actually uh, without interpreting what kind of patterns our model based, uh, bases their prediction on, we cannot like formulate a better problem any better or plan a better data acquisition. Uh, so, uh, but of course, uh, as I will show really soon, uh, there is one problem with interpretation of the uh, of the parameters that the models learn from the data. And this is actually quite interesting because this paper by Stefan Haufer uh, 
uh, originally uh, called on the interpretations of the weight vectors of linear classifiers when coming to the brain data. It is, seems to be to have started quite uh, quite an active uh, research and uh, contributed in, in, in deep learning interpretation quite obviously, but it, it actually came from our domain. So let me explain the problem very briefly. Let's assume that you have two classes. So this is a binary classification task, so the red one and, and the, uh, the red one and the blue one. Uh, and uh, both of these classes are basically Gaussian distributions with, with similar covariance and, and the variance uh, along the X axis is larger than the variance of the Y axis. And if we measure those using two channels, for example, this one and this one, you can see that uh, the differences between the classes are present in the channel one, but are not present in the channel two. However, uh, uh, if we use a bias option, uh, optimal classifier, which is just the linear discriminant analysis in this case, uh, it will project our data uh, on this axis and will assign uh, the weight uh, to the channel one. Uh, uh, it will assign the greater weight uh, to this channel just to compensate for, for the covariance structure of this data. Uh, then to the to the to the channel where the actual differences are observed, and this is why uh, the to like saying that for example this channel has a greater weight that's and that kind of that, that doesn't automatically mean uh, that uh, uh, this channel is important for the classification because it, it can for example be used just to filter out the noise. Okay, so that's why uh, the interpretation of parameters that the model extracts from the data is not is not a very straightforward thing, and uh, it started the whole debate on how to develop the procedures to compensate for these discrepancies and actually try to interpret what the model learns from the data. I won't maybe explain this much, but basically uh, this pattern net and pattern attribution approaches allows also to, uh, which is a more general. Uh, deep learning interpretation methods uh, uh, were developed heavily based on, 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 on this half a paper, which came from our field. Okay, uh, coming back to the methods that we developed here, if we, for example, have a five class classification problem, we can identify uh, which uh, feature in the uh, in, in the final layer has the most contribution uh, uh, to this particular class for example let's talk about this class over here uh, and then once we identify this feature using different types of heuristics we automatically get uh, the just because of the architecture of the network we automatically get the corresponding spatial filter and the corresponding temporal filter sort of for free uh, and that's uh, to explore what kind of patterns the model learned from the data. And then we, of course, use this uh, compensation for the, for the feature covariance. 